We need to talk. USB 2, USB 3, USB 3.1, Gen 1, Gen 2, which is now 3.2 Gen 2, HDMI 2.0B, Thunderbolt 1, 2, and 3. There's just too many connections and too many names for them. Recently though, with the launch of the Intel Tiger Lake H series processors and Thunderbolt 4 and USB 4 for that matter, there's hope for things to become at least a bit more concise, as well as bring up the average speed of connections overall in the future. So in this decoder episode, the explainer series here on my channel, let's talk about what Thunderbolt 4 is, how it compares to Thunderbolt 3, its predecessor, and even USB 4. Today's sponsor, the 11th gen Intel Core H series processors with features like one click instant overclocking, up to eight cores and 16 threads with Intel's Turbo Boost Max 3.0 to hit up to five gigahertz in clock speeds and more is the first chipsets to support Thunderbolt 4. And it also uses Intel's VTD technology for direct memory access security that also makes it even more secure. First, let's talk about what Thunderbolt is and go through a common use case. A huge group of people that have widely adopted Thunderbolt for a long time are video editors. So let's take this Acer Predator Triton 500SE that was sent to me for this video. Inside it, our sponsor's 11th gen Intel Core H series based i9 processor with its 20 PCIe 4.0 lanes directly connected to the CPU, enabling much faster storage speeds as well as faster connection to the discrete graphics memory for better performance. Which in this case, in this laptop, is connected to an RTX 3080. Basically, it's easily up there for one of the most powerful laptops out right now. The H in the CPU name, by the way, denotes that it's one of Intel's high performance chips optimized for mobile. So I can boot up DaVinci Resolve, the program that I've been editing on lately, and even from this park, not plugged in, I can edit 8K red footage, no problem. But 8K footage, and even my much more usual 4K 10-bit footage, can eat up a lot of storage, even if it's just for one project. So maybe using this Thunderbolt-capable laptop and a Thunderbolt-capable drive, I can leave the footage on the drive and edit directly from there instead of transferring it to my computer and taking up all of my precious internal storage. Thunderbolt has, for the most part, always kind of been the fastest, most widely available connection type, and for a long time was the only way to be able to edit like that. And if you weren't trying to edit directly off of it, you could just transfer footage so much faster compared to other options out there where it could be the difference of hours for transferring a project sometimes. And of course, time is money when you're editing. First, a little bit of history. Thunderbolt was introduced by Intel and Apple on the MacBook Pro in 2011. And with it came a single port that could transfer data up to 10 gigabits per second that also used the mini DisplayPort connector as well as used the DisplayPort protocol to transfer video. In 2013, Thunderbolt 2 was introduced and the speed was doubled to 20 gigabits per second. Then in 2015, Thunderbolt 3 doubled it again to 40 gigabits per second, but also changed the connector from mini DisplayPort to the now becoming much more universal USB-C. It also added 10 gigabit per second ethernet connections so that you could use it for network access if it was plugged into a dock with an ethernet cable connected to it, for example. And it added the ability to use the USB power delivery standard to then give power to and from the device through the cable at the same time. Also, because of that bandwidth, it became popular on eGPUs, which are housings like this Razer Core X that I have here that allows you to put a desktop graphics card inside it and plug in a Thunderbolt-capable laptop to it to allow the computer to use that GPU as if it was inside the computer itself. And this drastically increases the graphics performance for games, video editing, and anything else that is a lot of graphics. There was a catch, however. That was technically a maximum speed and the minimum that was required was only 16 gigabits per second to get Thunderbolt 3 certification. So you could technically get anywhere between that minimum and maximum depending on what the manufacturer chose to do with their Thunderbolt 3 product. And that's confusing, right? That's where Thunderbolt 4 comes in. 
In 2020, Thunderbolt 4 was introduced by Intel, who owns the proprietary tech used in the connection. But around that same time, they actually took the proprietary tech that they owned from Thunderbolt 3 and gave it to the USB IF, the body that governs USB. And it's because of that tech that USB 4, which is slowly starting to emerge, is able to hit that same 40 gigabit per second bandwidth compared to USB 3.2 Gen 2's 20 gigabit per second, which is the fastest USB available before USB 4. And that then made USB 4 and Thunderbolt 3 very similar in a lot of ways. Now, Thunderbolt 4 didn't increase speeds like all the previous versions did. Instead, it raises the bar for the minimum. So Thunderbolt 4, 3, and USB 4 all have the same peak speeds of 40 gigabits per second, the same 100 watts of USB power delivery, 10 gigabit ethernet, and all use the same USB-C connector. USB 4 makes things a bit more confusing with USB 4 20 gig and USB 4 40 gig, but I digress. For minimums though, USB 4 has a 10 gigabit per second minimum speed, and as mentioned, Thunderbolt 3 has a 16 gigabit per second minimum. Thunderbolt 4 though, raises that to 32 gigabit per second. In addition to that, it requires the ability to be able to run two 4K monitors or one 8K display from the cable, compared to the one 4K display with Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4. It also adds the requirement that a mouse or keyboard connected through Thunderbolt 4 needs to be able to wake the computer, which seems small, but it just simply wasn't in the standard, and it's a nice thing to require. Another benefit I am personally thankful for is the fact that Thunderbolt 4 cables will be able to work passively, as in without an electric circuit built in, called active cables when it's present. And they can do that up to two meters compared to the about a half a meter before. So, Unlike before when you would have to spend more money for an active cable to get anything over half a meter, you now will only need those for things over two meters, which means it'll cover most desks for cheaper. Bottom line, Thunderbolt 4 will give you the maximum versions of Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4 in one. Now, manufacturers do have to pay Intel to use the Thunderbolt 4 name, so it will cost OEMs a little bit more. But on the other side, that means more accountability, higher standards, hopefully even cheaper cables, for us consumers. Now to get Thunderbolt 4, you would have to have a computer that has one of Intel's 11th gen CPUs, sometimes called Tiger Lake CPUs in it. Again, like this 11th gen Intel i9 powered laptop. And then any of the growing number of Thunderbolt 4 or even Thunderbolt 3 USB 4 docks, monitors, SSDs, or eGPUs. And there you go, hope that helped explain some difference between Thunderbolt 4 and 3 and USB 4. Shout out again to the 11th gen Intel Core H series processors for sponsoring this video. You can click the link below to learn more about those and what they're capable of doing. If you like this video though, please thumbs up or share it. It's greatly appreciated. Also check out the rest of the channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and ding the bell next to word subscribe so you get notified when I do new videos. As always though, regardless, thanks for watching.